Singapore's air quality improved in 2020 with a rating in the good to moderate range on all days last year. Now, that's according to NEA's inaugural air and water quality report. However, Singapore also exceeded WHO air quality guidelines for PM10 and PM2.5, sulfur dioxide and ozone limits. And that's despite reduced economic and transport activity due to the pandemic. To make sense of this, we're joined by Professor Rajaseka Balasubramanian from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at NUS. Professor Bala, this may come as a surprise to some of our viewers. Why did Singapore exceed particulate matter and sulfur dioxide limits last year, and despite the reduced economic activities that we had? And is this a cause for concern? Actually, uh, if you look at the levels of air pollution we had last year in 2020, compared to what we had in the previous years, certainly there was a dip in the levels of air pollution. However, the dip in air pollution in response to the curtailment of uh, economic activities and transport-related activities uh, was not so significant as we expected. Uh, so, so some of the pollutants, for example, PM2.5, sulfur dioxide, and ozone still exceeded air quality guidelines despite the in decrease we have had uh, last year. Uh, so the reason for that uh, uh, observation is that it's a very complex uh, problem. Air pollution in general is a multifaceted, uh, nonlinear, complex problem. Uh, so what it essentially means is that air pollution is uh, uh, kind of arises from multiple sources, domestic sources, also external sources of air pollution. Although we were able to contain the levels of air pollution within Singapore by curtailing economic activities and the transportation-related activities, however, the other countries in the region uh, continued business as usual. So that could have played a role uh, in uh, not decreasing levels of three pollutants you mentioned as significantly as we expected. But on top of that, there is some interesting chemistry that takes place, which we try to unravel uh, by studying air pollution problems uh, much more closely last year compared to the previous years. So the so-called secondary air pollution that you mentioned before uh, happened to sort of increase are uh, contributing to the increase in the concentration of ozone, which is a well-known secondary air pollutant. Likewise, the case of particles, part of the particles are coming from uh, its uh, uh, direct sources. So particles are directly emitted from the uh, power sector, from industrial sector, from the transportation sector. And some particles are also produced in the atmosphere through complex chemical reactions which turned out to be more favorable under clear blue sky conditions than we had last year. Now, Professor, what are some of the challenges of controlling ozone levels in, in urban areas? Well, ozone continues to be a challenge uh, for air quality managers, not only in Singapore, but also in other countries. And the reason is that uh, it's again a secondary air pollution and uh, coming from uh, different sources involving, for example, uh, oxides of nitrogen, mainly coming from the traffic. Then we get organic compounds, which not only come from the traffic, but also from industries. So although we were able to reduce the level of uh, oxides of nitrogen, primarily emitted from the traffic, we still had organic compounds coming from elsewhere, which triggered the formation of ozone, uh, especially under blue sky conditions. And uh, uh, although we reduced the levels of particles, PM2.5, it had an unintended consequence in terms of promoting the formation of ozone. So essentially, we had to look at PM2.5 and ozone as one entity not as two separate pollutants, because the kind of chemistry that's involved with the formation of ozone is also strongly associated with the formation of secondary aerosols. So we are looking at these two pollutants in tandem, we can come up with a better air pollution control policy that will enable us to reduce these two pollutants far more significantly than we have managed to do so far. 
And Professor Bala, as we res resume more economic activity this year and beyond this year, do you expect, you know, a worsening of our air and water quality? Well, in principle, economic growth and environmental degradation, in particular air pollution, are strongly associated with each other. But certainly we have to boost our economy as it's happening as far. But the question is, can we make our economy greener than what it has been so far? And that's the direction actually we are going uh, by making use of the concepts uh, introduced by the Singapore Green Plan 2030. So essentially, Singapore Green Plan 2030 provides a blueprint for Singapore to move towards sustainable development, which means that we can still boost our economy without degrading the quality of the environment we live in. So basically, we have to improve our livability and by adopting uh, multiple approaches, we have to have a multi-pronged uh, multi approach in order to improve uh, air quality which does not mean that we have to curtail our economic activities. Professor Bala, thank you very much for that. That was Professor Rajaseka Bala Subramanian from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at NUS.